The Sims feels like it's been with us for a lifetime, even back into the 90s, but the original game didn't actually arrive until February the 4th 2000. Come to think of it, that's still 16 years ago. Jesus. Back then I had an AMD K6 processor, with some kind of diamond edge video card, which wasn't a bad combination at the time, but the original game still took an age to load and wasn't the smoothest experience in the world. We were talking a pretty advanced simulation, especially for that era. We'd had Sim City simulations, sports simulations, and even ant simulations, but never really a people simulator. Of course, since then, things have advanced even further, and the specification requirements have moved with the times, so clearly a lot has evolved. The Sims is a game which I've dipped in and out of over that time in various releases and with various expansion packs, but remembering exactly what's changed, what's advanced, is tricky. It's the same as when you try and remember back to a Spectrum game you played in the 80s. Back then it felt graphically amazing, and it's that feeling which stays with us more than any technical aspect. Here's the subsequent timeline. Sims 2 was released in September 2004. 3 in June 2009. Just imagine and 4 in September 2014. With that sort of spacing, you can probably expect 5 in around 2019. Disconcertingly, the year The Running Man is set. Running! It really takes a side-by-side -side comparison to see exactly how far we've come, and thankfully, I find that kind of thing fascinating. So, let's take a comparative look, and let's begin with the biggest difference of them all, the graphics. Okay, so here's the first Sims game. It doesn't look drastically different from what we have now. I mean, the resolution is lower, the detail is a lot lower, but you can still make out what's what. We still have wallpaper, shadows, carpets, expressions, kind of. But the biggest change is a technical one. All the games which follow are fully 3D rendered environments. The first game, however, is completely isometric. You can zoom in and out and choose between four perspectives, but your viewpoint is fixed to this 45 degree angle. Back in 2000, that felt pretty incredible and was perfect for providing a godlike perspective, but now it feels stiff, inflexible and uncooperative. The Sims themselves are still 3D rendered, but the environment is a pseudo 3D world. Given the technical restrictions of hardware back then, you can understand why. My K6 wouldn't have even loaded a full 3D explorable environment, let alone made it playable. Other than that, everything else graphic related is just a refining process. Higher resolution, higher detail, higher fidelity. So, let's move on to the gameplay. The first thing you'll notice is the neighbourhood. The first game featured a predefined hood, with more available through expansion packs. For most people, the main goal was to establish your sim family and then progress up to the mansion at the top of the map. Game 2 brought in two additional neighbourhoods, which allowed some customization, but crucially entire neighbourhoods could be built from scratch and added to the menu screen. This carried on into the third game with a pre-designed world, but also the ability to add new worlds, rather than neighbourhoods, as and when you wanted. We also had greater flexibility to travel around these worlds and a more expansive feel. The fourth game is a kind of a backstep. The customization ability is absent, but instead of openness, we've got three pre designed worlds and a more restrictive method of navigating them. The game has shifted more to focus on the individual rather than the larger perspective. When it comes to building customization, one limits you to just two floors, with no scope for loft space nor basements. 2 brought in an incredible 5 floors, or 15 via the university pack and a cheat code. Roof types such as Bagona were also available with expansion packs. Sims 3 added basements into the World Adventures expansion, and then 4 went and spoilt our 15 floor fun with just a 4 floor maximum. Also, what happened to auto roof functions? Okay, let's move into the game mechanics and start with the basics. Life stages. Sims 1 has three stages, baby, child and adult. Although babies are merely objects in this instance, which quickly turn into children after three days. Once they're in that child state, they remain there indefinitely. No growing up, no dying, nothing. 
The exception is if you have the Making Magic expansion, where they can age to adults with a charm, but the end result is a completely random adult who may vary considerably from their childhood appearance. Sims 2 brought six life stages into play, baby, toddler, child, teen, adult and elder, with an additional young adult with the University expansion. You can also now die, but only the active plot ages. Sims 3 incorporated these all into the base pack, along with aging on all plots during play. And Sims 4 did its common trick of regression, with toddler taken out, meaning that you no longer get to teach your children to walk or talk. And babies, once again, are reduced to mere objects. Talking about babies, pregnancy in the first game is a very easy affair. A simple mouse click and boom, baby appears. Other than skin colour, no genetics are passed on either. Sims 2 brings a 3 day pregnancy and it's worth noting that men could be abducted by aliens and return back to Earth pregnant. God, it's all about the Arnie movies today, isn't it? 3 and 4 follow a similar course with the alien routine available in expansion packs. Once you've got kids, you better be afraid though, because the first game would banish kids with low grades to military school forever. The second game was slightly less harsh, you had the option of private or public school, with then just a social worker removing them for poor grades, potentially to be adopted by another plot. And then with the arrival of Sims 3, ah, who cares, kids don't even have to attend school, Hey! When it comes to more immediate timescales, you may notice a lack of structured weeks on one. There are no weekdays, weekends or days off. It's just a rolling week. You can miss work or school, provided you attend the next day, otherwise you are out. This was quite fortunate if you wanted a new job because you couldn't actually quit your occupation. Firing was the only way. 2 introduced a 7 day week and varying days off. You can also call in sick, to quit or even retire if you're an elder. School kids also have weekends off. The same was true of 3 and 4, although you need the seasons pack to call in sick. Still, you can just bunk off if you don't mind dropping a bit of performance. So, how about interactions with other sims? Well, all the games featured the home phone with a mobile introduced in 3. Phone calls in 1 were usually either prank or for baby adoption. 2 allowed other sim friends to phone, 3 allowed richer experiences with sims via the phone, and 4 included interactivity for children to phone and ask for playdates with other sim kids. As for NPCs, most were not interactive in 1, including maids and social workers. This opened up with the second game, further with the third, and finally, all NPCs allow interaction in the fourth, even the drivers. The mundane task of bills went from delivery every three days to Tuesdays and Thursdays for two and three, and a more acceptable weekly in the fourth instalment. One thing missing from all the sequels is the household account screen depicting income and expenditure over the past three days. I think this probably reminded people of reality too much. After all, The Sims is a great tool for escapism, not accountancy. Next up we have memories. One, nope, no memories. Two, allowed you to collect visible memories and use memory markers for conversation. Three, added screenshots after an update patch, and in four, they are retained but completely optional. Aspirations, which were a structural requirement in two, were not part of the first game. In three, they were replaced by lifetime wishes and happiness points, whilst four saw them merge with aspirations returning, but acting also like a lifetime wish. It's a similar story for once as they replaced with goals and wishes in the latter games, although 2 was the only game to be blessed with fears. 
Skills, however, were with us from the first game. They increased from 6 up to 20 in the last game with additional via expansion. So what have we learned? Well, the first game was more of a robotic life simulation. The characters of The Sims varied, they had different personalities with different levels of different traits, but they weren't driven by defined differences, by goals or by distinct personality characteristics. You played the game and progressed each individual as you went, but underneath they were all fairly similar, more like a human flock simulator, which is how it was intended. With the first game, Maxis weren't entirely convinced it would be a success. In fact, the idea started as an architect simulator by creator Will Wright kind of an extension to SimCity. Will eventually realised that playing with people in this environment was more fun than building, and so the basic Sims premise was born. It wasn't until the huge sales figures that they realised they had a winner on their hands though, leading to substantial development being poured into the sequels and further humanisation of the Sims themselves. The first game actually became the biggest selling PC game of all time and was only touted by its sequel, which brought a lot of changes into the fold and really took the series in its current direction. The create a sim aspect was a big part of that. Ok, let's look at the sims themselves. The create a sim has undergone various revisions throughout time, but let's start with the name. In one. Sounds like bullseye doesn't it? The last name is the same for all the sims in the household. Same in 2 unless you have university, but 3 allowed you to have different last names and the ability to change the household name. Getting with the times. In 1, head styles determines lots of your features including hairstyle, shape, hair and eye colour. Facial hair, the list goes on. This changed in 2 where head style only determines the shape of your sim's head. The flexibility of those options also expanded through the sequels. 2 allowed hair and eyebrow colour to be chosen from 4 colours. 3 allowed individual selection of both hair and eyebrow colour using a large colour chart, as well as opening up options for highlights, root colour and vibrant colouring. Sims 4 simplified things a little, allowing 16 hair colours although still allowing independent colourisation of features. Skin colour progressed from 3 options in the first game to 4, to a range of skin tones including red, blue and green, and then to 16 in 4 with 2 custom colours of green and blue. Body type in 1 is dependent on clothing being worn by the sim. This changed in 2 with thin, fit and fat body types. 3 brought sliders into play and allowed much more controlled adjustments, and this was expanded even further in 4, allowing all parts of the body to be stretched and resized independently from each other. Clothing has changed as well from the rather basic set of flippable options to thumbnails allowing individual customization, and this was further enhanced in 3 with create a style, 4 again simplified by taking 2's lead and adding various colour presets. Ok, sleepwear, swimwear and formal wear. Originally they were chosen automatically, no choice for us at all I'm afraid. 2 gave us a choice and 3 retained the choice but merged underwear and sleepwear into the same category. 4 simply took away the ability to choose career outfits. Ok, so what about accessories? The first game as you may expect was fairly rigid and you get what you got. 2 allowed glasses to be removed, but most accessories were determined by your sim's outfit. 3 gave us lots of customization with all accessories, which was thankfully retained in 4. Now as we saw earlier, personalities were simply controlled by 25 personality points configured to different aspects of your sim. You're not required to use all the points, and although the changes weren't massively dramatic, I guess this was quite a flexible approach to creating your own individual characters. 2 added aspirations into this fold to further differentiate, but you were forced to use all your personality points. The third game abolished all this and instead brought in a trait system, which was supposed to give sims a more realistic and unique personality. For some it felt limiting, but it did add a wider gap between personality types. 4 again took this formula and simplified with the requirement of choosing 3 traits at young adult stage with an aspiration. Once you complete an aspiration you can then receive further unique traits. Now if we take a step back from the individual sims, we get the family, and the first game didn't really play around with this too much. You got your household family but there was no family tree. The second game changed this and relationships between spouses, siblings and children were established. This continued through 3 with the addition of boyfriends and girlfriends, and 4 is essentially a step backwards to 2. 
And that's pretty much the bulk of the changes through the games. I mean, there's a lot more in terms of gameplay, emotional characteristics, graphics and nuances, but we could be here all day listing every individual change. Which game you prefer is a really personal preference. Many prefer the functionality, flexibility and core gameplay brought about in the second game, highlighted by it outselling every other PC game ever made. Although the first game was revolutionary in its game style, the second game was a big evolutionary step in what it brought to the table. But also, a lot of people are massive fans of the realism, additional customization, and playability of the third game. Whatever your preference, we're currently at the fourth game. And although we're blessed with now somewhat cartoony graphics and a scattered emotional aspect that can change as quickly as the wind direction, there's no denying that the graphical engine has come on leaps and bounds. Everything is clearer, brighter and more pleasing to the eye. 4 is also arguably the easiest of the games to get into. For me personally, I feel that 2 was an outstanding game and probably offered the most in quirks and gameplay style. 3 and 4 are great games, but I feel like a combination of the two may have produced a slightly more engaging experience. But the first game and what it brought to the table, even purely for its nostalgia and revolutionary experience, remains my favourite in the series. Of course, this is subjective and you'll no doubt have a different opinion. So what is yours? Drop me a comment below and let me know. Meanwhile, I'll leave you with an object comparison from each of the games and bid you farewell. Thank you for watching this Sims comparison. I've done plenty of videos in the past. I hope to do quite a few in the future. So click one below, subscribe, put a thumbs up, share this video, or even contribute towards my Patreon if you feel like it. In any case, I thank you for watching, and I bid you a good night. with no scope for loft space nor basements. Two brought in an incredible five floors, or 15 via the university pack and a cheat code. Roof types such as Bogona were also available with expansion packs. Sims 3 added basements into the World Adventures expansion, and then 4 went and spoilt our 15 floor fun with just a four floor maximum. Also, what happened to auto roof functions? Okay, let's move into the game mechanics and start with the basics. Life stages. Sims 1 has three stages, baby, child and adult. Although babies are merely objects in this instance, which quickly turn into children after three days. Once they're in that child state, they remain there indefinitely. No growing up, no dying, nothing. The exception is if you have the Making Magic expansion, where they can age to adults with a charm, but the end result is a completely random adult who may vary considerably from their childhood appearance. Sims 2 brought six life stages into play, baby, toddler, child, teen, adult and elder with an addition packs, but remembering exactly what's changed, what's advanced, is tricky. It's the same as when you try and remember back to a Spectrum game you played in the 80s. Back then it felt graphically amazing, and it's that feeling which stays with us more than any technical aspect. Here's the subsequent timeline. Sims 2 was released in September 2004. 3 in June 2009. Just imagine and 4 in September 2014. With that sort of spacing, you can probably expect 5 in around 2019. Disconcertingly, the year The Running Man is set. Running! It really takes a side-by-side -side comparison to see exactly how far we've come, and thankfully, I find that kind of thing fascinating. So, let's take a comparative look, and let's begin with the biggest difference of them all, the graphics. Okay, so here's the first Sims game. It doesn't... <laughs> the first thing you'll notice is the neighbourhood. The first game featured a predefined hood, with more available through expansion packs. 
For most people, the main goal was to establish your sim family and then progress up to the mansion at the top of the map. Game 2 brought in two additional neighbourhoods, which allowed some customization, but crucially entire neighbourhoods could be built from scratch and added to the menu screen. This carried on into the third game with a pre-designed world, but also the ability to add new worlds, rather than neighbourhoods, as and when you wanted. We also had greater flexibility to travel around these worlds and a more expansive feel. The fourth game is a kind of a backstep. The customization ability is absent, but instead of openness we've got three pre-designed worlds and a more restrictive method of navigating them. The game has shifted more to focus on the individual rather than the larger perspective. When it comes to building customization, one limits you to just two floors. The Sims feels like it's been with us for a lifetime, even back into the 90s, but the original game didn't actually arrive until February the 4th, 2000. Come to think of it, that's still 16 years ago. Jesus. Back then I had an AMD K6 processor, with some kind of Diamond Edge video card, which wasn't a bad combination at the time, but the original game still took an age to load and wasn't the smoothest experience in the world. We were talking a pretty advanced simulation, especially for that era. We'd had Sim City simulations, sports simulations, and even ant simulations, but never really a people simulator. Of course, since then, things have advanced even further, and the specification requirements have moved with the times. So clearly, a lot has evolved. The Sims is a game which I've dipped in and out of over that time in various releases and with various expansions look drastically different from what we have now. I mean the resolution is lower, the detail is a lot lower, but you can still make out what's what. We still have wallpaper, shadows, carpets, expressions, kind of. But the biggest change is a technical one. All the games which follow are fully 3D rendered environments. The first game however is completely isometric. You can zoom in and out and choose between four perspectives, but your viewpoint is fixed to this 45 degree angle. Back in 2000 that felt pretty incredible and was perfect for providing a godlike perspective, but now it feels stiff, inflexible and uncooperative. The Sims themselves are still 3D rendered, but the environment is a pseudo 3D world. Given the technical restrictions of hardware back then, you can understand why. My K6 wouldn't have even loaded a full 3D explorable environment, let alone made it playable. Other than that, everything else graphic related is just a refining process. Higher resolution, higher detail, higher fidelity. So, let's move on to the gameplay. 